What obstacles do you face that bring you back to this earth over and over and over again? What are they? The senses. Thank you. What else? Egoism. Egoism. Yes, your ego. What else? Attachment. What else? Pardon? Yeah, clinging to bodily life. What else? Hatred. Hatred. Aversion. Wonderful. Okay. Remember these things well. Memorize them. Know them inside out. Why? They are the cause of all your problems. If you can really understand these next few sutras, it can prevent a lot of suffering in your life. A lot of suffering. For example, you see yourself crying, Oh, I want this, but I can't get it. No, immediately. It is my attachment to wanting that that is making me miserable. The world is not making you miserable. It is your attachment to wanting something that's making you miserable. When you feel hatred, where is it coming from? Where is it coming from? Inside. Yourself. It's not someone. Yes, someone may have put that hatred into your heart, but it's you who allowed it to fester. It is you who's allowed it to grow. It is you that has allowed it to make it horrible and ugly inside of you. So what do you need to do? Understand that hatred, oh, I don't want this. Aversion is another word for, for hatred. I don't want to go there. My master used to say, I want or I don't want will put you in trouble. He always said that to me, Melanie, it's not <coughs> what you want or what you don't want. It is about what is. If this is the way it is, then just do it. And I could, used to say to my Guru Dev, why? I remember um, many years ago, uh, when I was, um, when Guru Dev had visited us in Gibraltar, and there was an audience of about 300 people at the Hindu temple, his first visit, and somebody, he just picked up questions, somebody had asked, can Melanie initiate us? Because we believe you don't do any more initiations. So can Melanie initiate us? So I thought, oh my God, who am I to initiate? This is all going on in my mind. And thank God Gurudev said, if her husband Shanky doesn't mind, she can initiate anyone on my name. So, of course, my husband stood up there and said, no, I don't mind. <laughs> he wasn't sure what he was getting into. <laughs> anyway, the next day, Guru Dev was in my house. And I go, Guru Dev, you know, I really can't do this. I can't initiate people. You know, I'm a householder. I'm, I've got children. My children were younger then. And I, you know, uh, I, I don't want to initiate anyone. I'm nobody special to initiate. And then he said to me, Melanie, is not about, Thomas, are you okay? Yeah. Thank you. It's not about what you want or what you don't want. It is what it is. I don't want, I don't want to do this. I, he said, and he said to me, that's also ego. Do you know, I never looked at that, it that way. I always thought I was being humble. Do you know what I mean? But sometimes it's the wrong time to be humble. Sometimes when somebody gives you a job to do, you should just do it. Oh, I'm not good enough. That's all low self-esteem. That's all, you know, showing that I wasn't connected with the divine. And when the great master was telling me, do, do it, I was saying no. And many times in our life, and that since he taught me that lesson, it was such an incredible lesson. Because I have seen so many people who can do wonderful things in their life. And they think they're being humble by saying, no, I'm not good enough. I'm not good enough. And when you do that, when you put yourself down like that, you don't do the best in your life that you can do. So I realized I had to learn that lesson. That's why I'm telling you, you know, 
That's also ego. Oh, I can't, I can't. Sometimes you are called to live up to a challenge that you find so difficult and so hard. Really, I found that very difficult and very hard. I didn't want to do that. I just wanted to be quiet, meditating on the side. I don't want to be a teacher. <laughs> I don't want to initiate. But again, little did I know, little did I know that when I started doing all those things, that seeing other people in joy would bring me such joy. You see, I was in a different place. I was in a different, I didn't understand it at that time. But many years later, the answers came through. So sometimes when you are pushed and you are pulled to do something higher and you think you can't do it, listen. Listen to the voice that's saying you can. It's not about what you want. Oh, it's too much responsibility, it's this and that. No, stop all the nonsense. Just do it. Face the challenge. And that's what I learned from it. You know, this humility, I can't, I this and that, is also not good, all right? Because we always look at it the other way. But what I want, what is easy for me to do, what is, you know, I always want to go for what I want to do. But sometimes what you want to do is not necessarily what is good for you in your life. You know, many times I see people in this world, they want to be somebody else. Oh, I want to be a good singer like you. Oh, I want to be a good a computer expert like you. Oh, I want to have the business you have. They want that. But sometimes that's not what they were born to do. They're born to do something else. And sometimes that something else is maybe something they never even thought about. And it suddenly comes in their way. And because they're so fixated on what they think they should do, they don't use that opportunity that's come. It slips away. Many times I have seen this in people. They're so busy wanting to be somebody else or something else that the opportunity comes. It's a bit scary. It's a bit frightening. No, no, I want to be like that one. And that is really the right thing for them. So look at your mind when you get opportunities or when you don't get opportunities. What is it doing? Does it have aversion? Does it have attachment? If it has attachment, oh, I want to do this, I want to be famous, I want to do this. <gasps> I just, notice that if you have the attachment, the pain will come. If you have the aversion, the pain will also come. And then you don't fulfill your life's mission. It's all about fulfilling our life's mission while we are on earth. As I say, we will all soon die. <laughs> so we need to fulfill what we need to do while we're living as much as possible as souls living in a human body. And this is what ignorance is all about. And here Sri Patanjali tells us, you know, all the rest, egoism, ignorance, um, I mean, egoism, hatred, aversion, attachment, clinging to bodily life, all comes from and what is ignorance? Last week we he pointed, Sri Patanjali pointed it out so clearly to us. What did he say? Ignorance is regarding, remember? Forgotten already, right? The impermanent as permanent. The impure as pure. The painful as pure. That's it, good girl. And the non-self? That's the self. Okay, so let's cover the first one. The impermanent as permanent. Page, uh, page 86. Oh, why am I not wearing my glasses? No wonder I can't see. <laughs> impermanent as permanent. Are you permanent? No. Well, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Good answer. Did you hear her? Can you say that again? I am, but my body isn't. Correct. And what about your mind? That's debatable. <laughs> we'll I debate next time. Yes. Yeah, because that's I'm interesting. I'm not sure if that is permanent or that comes back with the soul or not. 
It does. It does, huh? But let's work a little, right? As you think, so you become. If your mind is troubled and you leave the book, let me tell you a story that Guru Dev told us. Should I? Maybe that would be really a nice way to, to explain it to you. Um, once I was with him and uh, we talked about suicide. And so I said to him, Guru Dev, what of suicide? What happens to the soul? He said, Melanie, that is really one of the worst things that can happen. Why? Because the mind, when it has the body, right, it's disturbed. It's disturbed about something that is happening here in this world. Correct or incorrect? Mm -hmm. It's confused, the suffering, though, maybe my boyfriend left me, or my girlfriend left me, or this one left me, or that one. It's always something to do with attachment or aversion. Or this one, I lost all my money, or something like that, right? So, the mind is so... The problem is on this earth. So when they kill themselves or they commit suicide, what's happened? They have a the mind. That's right. They take it with them. They take it with them. Because, and what's the worst thing? They've lost the body now. They can't fix the problem. And because they're not elevated enough, they can't go to the other side. This is what they call limbo purgatory. They can't go to the other side because they're still asphyxiated with that problem. The mind, the soul is, you see, there is the soul and then there's pure spirit. The soul is mind and, and energy and spirit. And then you've got the pure spirit. So if your mind is clear, you can see the pure spirit. You can see who you really are. If your mind is disturbed, you can't. So it gets... It, stuck, it gets stuck on the earthly plane. And it takes thousands of years for them to be released. How can we help these souls? Do we pray for them to go to the light? There are other souls on the other side that will help them. But many times, because you have no longer the body, these people are so attached to their body and the same problem. And this is where they talk about poltergeist and all these things. They're stuck until they want to release themselves. Sometimes they don't, because they're so stuck. And I don't know if you know this, many times you meet people with a problem. You know, they get so stuck, and no matter what you say to them, they don't want to let go of the problem. Have you seen that? Yes. They yeah. stick, stick, stick. And no matter what you tell them, what you say to them, they stick. Many times when I have people like that, I just send them a lot of light and love. And I pray that love surrounds them, and light surrounds them. Do it for these people. But you know when Guru Dev told me that it was such a great thing because I didn't know that in my life I was going to meet so many people who wanted to commit suicide. You know after that I met so many people and I realized so many people contemplate suicide. So every time they tell me, oh I might as well kill myself and they go, no, 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 I tell them this story. And you know what? It scares them so much. <laughs> they don't ever think of it again. I said, I'm going to tell you something. And I tell them this story, and they really get scared. I said, look, at least you have a body. Fix the problem while you're alive. You know, you can fix it. And then you give them yoga sutras, you know, so working from the philosophy, forgive this that has happened, how can I forgive it? I'm never going to be able to forgive it. And you teach them breathing, then you teach them meditation, and then you teach me, introduce them to like-minded people full of love, who are full of kindness, and you try to shift their energy by putting them in an atmosphere surrounded by love, that they can shift out of this negative energy. And in my life, all the ones that wanted to commit suicide, and come to me desperate, phew, we've avoided it. And that must be about 30 or 40, maybe even more, 50 people that I've seen. So I thank my master so much for telling me this story. So any you know anybody who wants to commit suicide, tell them this story. And then tell them there's a way out while they have body. And then when they get out of it, they realize, you know, okay, life is tough. Life is tough. Buddha says life is full of suffering, isn't it? It is. And this is what it's saying. No, the things are impermanent. For not only for you, for everyone. 
the body is impermanent and the mind the mind is impermanent while it's stuck on the things of the earth so that's a good debate that you said and I don't like debate <laughs> you know so this is why we do the science that's why I say repeat mantras as much as possible think good thoughts so let's say tomorrow uh, and we never know let's say let's say me because I'm very comfortable saying me tomorrow I could die no problem with it say tomorrow I should get a car accident just at the last moment right because I've been doing my mantra for so many years over maybe I won't know what to say maybe the mantra will come out I'm hoping so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I know already whenever danger comes to me, the first thing I do is my mantra. Because thinking this is dangerous, or I'm already thinking, do you see? There are too many vrittis, there are too many thought patterns. So that's why I keep telling you, make it simple. Make your life simple. Make your thought patterns simple. It's not about all this information. This information, once you learn it, memorize it, know it well, keep it in your heart. And he'll tell you, okay, I'm making this, uh, I'm doing this action, and it's making me suffer. I'm doing this action, it's making me suffer. What can I do to change it so that my mind is simply peaceful? As our master said, make peace your God. And the mind will want it. It would like to make it complicated. It would like to ask more questions. It would like to debate. But the more you debate, there's more vrittis, right? So what's the point? All those thoughts will take you round and round and round and round and round. And there are some questions you will never be able to answer. Never. So what's the point? I remember when my husband passed away. Just a mouth hit. Some of his family members came to me. But why? But why? But why? But why? I said, I'll never be able to answer that. All I know is that we all die. It is as it is. It is, as it is. Why are you troubling your mind so much? He left easily and happily and peacefully. Don't disturb your energy. And please don't disturb mine. <laughs> I actually said that. Please don't disturb mine. I'm at peace with it, so don't disturb mine. I will not take it. I have gone through a lot of pain. You see, it's okay to tell people that. I don't need you to put these thoughts in my head. Did you see enough doctors? Did you do this? Did you do that? People do that, right? You know, you lost a sister. They will ask me, confuse you. And this is why I love this teaching. People will try and confuse you as if you should... Get worse and more into pain. Stay straight. Don't get confused. Make peace your God. It's not their fault. They're in ignorance. They don't understand. And it's like absolutely okay. But don't confuse yourself just because somebody else is in ignorance. Do you understand that? Stick with your peace. What are you here to do? To do the best you can while you're alive. The most good you can. You know, there's this lovely story. There was a really, really wise man. And everybody used to come all over the world to see him. And they say, oh, you're so wise. You have so much knowledge. You can chant so many mantras. You can do all this. Suddenly, one of his students came to him. You know, found another master. And you are very wise. But I feel so much peace with this master. And he kept on hearing about this master and this peace. So one day he goes, let's go and visit this, this master who has this peace. So this great intelligent teacher goes to this Buddhist master. And he goes, I have heard so many things about you from my students. I have heard you give them so much peace. So tell me, what is this great knowledge that you are giving them? And he looks at him and he goes, Simply be good. And this intelligent man said, Ha, 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 ha. That's too easy. All kindergarten children know that. Be good. Ha, ha, ha. Is that where you got your peace? And the um, Buddhist priest looks at him and says, Yes, all the kindergarten children know this. But do you practice? Do you practice it? 
He was rude and obnoxious to great master. He was angry. His ego was inflated. So where was his peace? Where was he good? How rude to go to a great master and speak like that. Do you see? So it's really very simple. And <coughs> the mind doesn't like simple. This is why Sri Patanjali has written all this and done. These are the pitholes, yeah? Potholes. Potholes, right? You say pitholes. Pitholes. That's it. Yeah, that's the right word. Bit of both. <laughs> <laughs> These are the pitfalls. Notice them, become clear, and then when you see that hole in the floor and you go, mm -mm, not going there, I have the knowledge now. I'm not still in ignorance. I have learned I'm not falling down this hole again. I refuse to. It was kind of like Louise told us that nice story in truthfulness. Do you remember? She said when she was talking about truthfulness, she realized how many untruths we say in a day. We tell our children, don't tell that, and don't say this, and don't say that. And so children learn to do the same. They don't say the truth. Until she realized, no more. And she realized that how many of these untruths were filtering it. Yes, they weren't going to cause great pain or create, cause great trouble. But eventually, the child will never be truthful to themselves. And if they're not truthful to themselves, they're not going to be truthful to her. So what is the point of making up all these, or don't do this and don't do that, and living a life of masks all your life? It was a lovely story. And then she asked her child, what did you say to your child? You said to her, uh, I just said, um, tell me what do you, what did I say? What is truthfulness? Or I have, you know, what do you mean by telling the truth? And she just said, well, mommy, it just means that you say what has happened. And I was like, oh yeah, that's right. And then she says, but you don't tell it. You make something else up. And that's where I realized, obviously she's looking at me where something has happened and then I'm on the phone going, oh no, like something else happened. You know, so I realized that I was obviously you know, not really knowing, but just like you say, trying to save face or trying not to, what I thought was my hurt somebody. So I just thought, no, if my eight-year-old daughter already knows that I'm not telling the truth, then I have to change. Yeah. So that she will tell the truth and then hopefully her friends will realise that it's okay to tell the truth in front of her because she tells the truth and, you know, just filter it all down. Yeah. That's how it starts. All the troubles when we grow up, you know? That's why. You know, and that's why so many relationships break down. 99% of relationships break down because people can't say the truth. How? Do you remember last week we studied it? Pleasantly. Beneficial. It should be beneficial. What else? Truthful. Thank you. And at the right time, in the right place. Absolutely right. So when you learn, you have to memorize all that. Huh? So when you learn to say the truth that way, you find that people will normally take it. You know, many times I see couples and they oh, I can't tell my husband or I can't tell my wife. She's going to get angry. And I said, yeah, because of the way you tell them. You know, I didn't like her to do this. And blah, 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 blah. You nag them or you scream at them or you get angry with them. Why don't you just sit down with them and say, you know, when you did that yesterday, it really hurt me. I just want you to know I'm really in pain. I know you didn't, don't want me to be in pain, but I am. Really? See, there's a way to do things. And there's so clearly Sri Patanjali tells us how to say it. And at the right time. Somebody comes home in a bad mood, don't say it at that time. Wrong. Timing. Wait till the person comes. Good mood, right time, right atmosphere. You know, this has been bothering me. I don't want to keep it inside because I love you so much or I care for you so much. If I keep it inside, I'm going to one day flare up. Just be truthful. And many times when you say the truth like that, people listen. You know, for me, it was really 
so, you know, something that is so small, something impure as pure, right? You know, for example, I say, you can't think, you, I used to think I couldn't say what I felt to my husband because he would get upset with me. Hmm? Or it was really my complex that I felt I wasn't good enough. So many times when we came home from work and I worked with him long hours, of course he couldn't cook, he wasn't a good cook, which is fine. But many times I came home and I was tired and I would cook and I'd get angry in a bad mood. Of course, when I learned this, and then of course when I got in a bad mood, you know what you do, pans and pots, bang, 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 kitchen cupboards, bang, you know, and all that nonsense, you know. And then he shouts, you shout, and you cry and feel sorry for yourself, and, oh, poor me syndrome, and there's war, you know. But when I learned the sutras, you know, it was all changed. One, I learned, if I'm going to be in the kitchen, I'm going to be happy in the kitchen. And if I'm not happy in the kitchen, I'm going to tell them straight. You know, darling, I really don't feel like cooking tonight. Sorry. <laughs> Full stop. And when I told them that, no problem. Should we go get a takeaway? Should we go down the street? Let's go. I'll take you out for dinner. Why did I spend 15 years with nonsense? Why could I say the truth right away? <laughs> doing counselling, oh my god, everybody does the same. It's not only me, it's everybody, you know? And the men the same, they come and tell me, oh, you know, my wife is so messy, she leaves everything. I think many men have told me this, huh? she's lazy, da da da. Tell her what you're feeling. Oh no, she's mad, she screams, and she gets in a bad temper, I'm not like this, you don't know what I am. And I go, well, fine, take her out for a nice dinner. Speak to her gently. Tell her how you're feeling. Talk to her. Oh, women are too emotional. Well, you're getting sick inside. You're not telling her. You're getting sick. You're keeping this inside. It's not good for you. You need to talk. Men need to talk. You need to tell them. I said, they'll tell you how they feel, so you need to tell them how you feel also. Very lovingly. Very nicely. And I said, when you treat women like that, nurture them, yeah, you know, they're like putty in your hands. Be smart how you do it. Give them a little rose, make them happy. Very easy for women to make men happy and men to make women happy. When you speak in love, in truth, in kindness, and <coughs> in hmm? Both sides have to work on it. Hmm? But always communicate. That's what is the biggest problem today. Fear. Fear. And if they don't like what you have to say, where are you coming from? Ask yourself, intent. What is your intention? Where are you coming from? If your intention is to hurt, just zip your mouth and don't talk. Go hide in your room till you're better. Hmm? Say, I'm a horrible person today. Admit it, go in your room and hide yourself. As Master Shivananda said, if you're going to make the world miserable, don't go out in the world. Stay in your room. Make yourself miserable. You don't have the right to disturb somebody else's life. You don't have that right to trespass on your neighbors. So go in your room and feel sorry for yourself. You're going to be out in the world, bring goodness out there. So uh, I love that. Master Shivananda was very strong. Master Shivananda is, for those who don't know, this wonderful master here. He's the master of our master. And uh, Sri Swami Satchitananda. And, you know, I, every time I hear those words, I feel as if I hear his voice. He had a very powerful voice, you know. And I hear those words, well, you don't have the right to disturb the world. So what happens afterwards? You don't have the right to disturb the world. And then you have Rittis in your mind. This is, what, this is why you have the science. You have Rittis in your <coughs> mind. And you understand their Rittis, their thoughts. Their thoughts. And if you look at the thoughts, what are the thoughts? They're based on something that is happening today. And then the first thing you do is, it's not permanent. I'm impermanent. So why am I putting so much attention into this one problem? You keep telling yourself, why am I putting so much attention into this? And then you will see it's your ego. So you zip it up and, and you... And you work on yourself. You'll cry. 
you face tapas, which is accepting pain for purification. You don't want to, you kick against it. Why do I have to be the one to make the changes? And as my aunt master said to me, because you're the yogi. Because <laughs> once I said to him, you know, somebody is so bad to me, so bad to me, and he goes, may peace bless that person. <gasps> Good, if I can't bless that person, how can I bless him? Make me a hypocrite. And he asked me, do you want peace? Yeah, I want peace. But, 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 do you want peace, Nellie? But, Guru, if you don't understand how much this person has ever, do you want peace? Yes. Then, you have to bless them and forgive them. Oh, but I'll be a hypocrite, Guru, Dev. Yes, in the beginning you will. In the beginning you will. But over time, when you keep blessing them, you see your heart will change. And exactly through. That's exactly what happened. That's exactly what happened. In time, I could no longer hate anyone. I could just love everyone. Ah, of course, you learn that some people can be nasty, so stay away, as Sri Patanjali tells us. Disregard. So you just learn to stay away. But the compassion and love grew in me. Not, you don't stay away, aversion, no aversion. You stay away because you know that that person doesn't know where you are, so better to just leave them. No point getting in their face. Hmm? They don't want to know you. <coughs> you just have to keep your peace and love everyone. Doesn't matter if they don't love you. It's okay. And that's the practice, that's the practice. Like the Buddhist priest said. What did he say? The Buddhist monk said. Just be good. <laughs> just be good. Good inside. Because if you're good inside, you're happy with you. All right? So, uh, good question, Monica. Very good question. And so, you see, if you have riddies and things that disturb in you, and you go out there and attack the world with it, fire does not put out a fire, no matter how we put it. You know, now we all heard about those 20 children that got shot. Right? It's terrible. And then I heard there was an argument that the teachers should have guns. Oh, it's ridiculous. Can you imagine? There'd be more deaths. It's a crazy argument. They should just get rid of the guns. It's almost like the truth is there, staring in their faces. And why won't they get rid of the gun laws? Everybody knows why. Money, 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 money. So children continue to die. Year after year after year, and the rulers and the leaders don't get the message, you know? Do you know the gun, um, sale of guns went up 20% mm -hmm. the next day in America, oh. as opposed to going down, everybody went out and bought fear, more no? guns. Fear. 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 Yeah. fear. And also fear of the law changing. Yeah. And yes. they wanted to already have it at home before not being able to get it. See, all this is based on ignorance. <laughs> See, all this behavior, egoism, fear, is based on ignorance. And this is why this knowledge was not given to people so many years ago. They hid it from us. They hid it from us because these are the secret keys for our freedom. And that's why they crucified people like Lord Jesus or anybody who spoke the truth because it allowed people to find their freedom and find their peace. But in this generation, nobody's going to take it away from us. We are too many. We are too many speaking up for truthfulness. And too many tired. We are too many tired of what we're seeing. And we are now standing up for goodness and for right actions. It's happening slowly, but it's happening. It's happening. And we need to increase this goodness. Because this is the truth. This is how we were born to live. You know, they talk about the four ages, Satya Yoga. We're in Kali Yoga now, right? And from Kali Yoga, we go back to Satya Yoga. Satya Yoga is the age of truth, where we're constantly communicating with what we call God or the divine universe or light, whatever you want to call it, and living like that beautifully. And that's why we were made, to live in the Garden of Eden and to be loving and to be joyful. And the Upanishads, oh, I'm going to read you the Upanishads right after I finish this, this is this sutra, because here it explains the next sutra really well. 
let me finish this. I'm getting way late because I just love this subject. You know, because we're so much more. We're so much more and we give it away for what people tell us and control. Everybody wants to put us in fear. If you don't do it this way, you're in trouble. Oh, you're going to go to hell. You're going to go... There's no hell. Hell is in our mind. We create the hell rings by doing things with having horrible thoughts. We create the hell. There's only love. And if we all died feeling that love, that's where we will go. Because as you think, you know that. When you get up in the morning happy and you're joyful, the whole house becomes happy and joyful. Simply in one moment, you love, everybody loves. You're miserable, your whole house is miserable. So keep that peace and keep that <coughs> joy and let everybody spread it. No, you should be miserable. Who told us? I don't know one spiritual person that I, I love and admire that is miserable. And yet all these religions are telling you, oh, be so serious, you have to be serious, oh, don't, you can't do this, you can't do that. All I say is don't hurt anyone, don't lie, don't cause pain. Sri Patanjali tells us this. Live a good life. We have everything, we have everything. Share it, and you're so lovingly sharing it. And thank you for my clock, and thank you for the food for everyone, and thank you for all the donations you make, because it's just so nice to share it with everyone. And then you feel so happy, that gives you so much happiness. And thinking, right, on those rutis that you talk about, the, the anger you feel towards someone, and keeping it in your mind, and keeping it in the room, what's better to do? <laughs> And this is why the motto, live to love, love to serve. But it takes time to grow like that. And the only reason it takes time is because we're in ignorance. If you're not in ignorance, then you're, you know what? People are trying to make me fearful, but I'm going to die anyway. Let me die for my truth. Let me die for my truth. Let me die honorable with dignity. Don't fear with dignity and honor. And... Um, Painful as pleasant, we talked about this a little bit last week, you know, how many people take drugs and they, you know, think it's pleasant, but it brings so much pain and so much sorrow and many things like that. Our actions, there's so many things we do that give us pain and we think it gives us pleasure. So we, we kind of got it wrong. And the non-self as the self, we think this body is who we really are. It's not. It's not permanent. And when you understand this truth, then everything fits in place. And that's why the greatest masters tell us to keep repeating, I'm not this body, I'm not this mind, immortal self I am. I'm not this body, I'm not this mind, immortal self I am. I'm not this body, I'm not this mind, immortal self I am. So if you tell yourself I'm immortal, you know, this body is temporary. I'm just here on... This is a university where we come to learn the universe. A T. So the universe is coming to teach us about who we are. So I'm here to learn. Who am I? Well, that's our degree. To learn who we are. Nothing else. Every other degree will die with you. Except the degree of your soul. It will never die. It will continue because that's who you are. That's what we're learning here. This is the real university. And it's only short. It's only a short time you go to university. So make the best of it. You don't want to come back and go through it all over again. And if you do come back and do it all over again, make sure you ask for a healthy body and a good mind so you can serve many. So many people can understand, become a good teacher in this world. So you can lift many souls. In the end, Swami Vivekananda himself said, in the beginning he said, he used to say, I don't want to come back to this world. But towards the end of his life, his prayer was, Dear God, if I ever have to come back in this world, please make sure that I never forget you and that I can use my life in service to raise many souls. Then bring me back. Otherwise, no. <laughs> Because there are many souls that li need lifting. What do you think you're all back here and studying this? You think you don't lift souls? It's your job. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here studying this. Why would you study this, this soul knowledge? Because you are born to lift souls. 
You are born to, in whichever way, in whichever field you are. You don't have to be a teacher sitting here to lift souls. You can be wherever you are in your own world, in your own country, in your own room, in your own job, wherever you walk. Beata was telling me a really nice story today. She was in London over the weekend, and she met some of her older friends that she hadn't seen for a long time. And they said to her, I love your energy. What's happened to you? You've changed. Give me your energy. Give me your peace. And she said she felt so good that she could do that. Isn't it nice? She could lift them. Isn't that great? You know? And, and, and isn't it nice that they recognize? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's something you should be, you know, not pride, but proud. Thank the divine energy for allowing you to be able to, to live someone, because look how happy it makes you, right? It makes you glow. And then you're doing your mission. So wherever you are, it's, it's all our mission. It's not just one person can do it because I'm a teacher here. What nonsense. You can do it through dance. You can do it through anywhere you want. And you can lift souls constantly by your joy, by your peace. I'm sure everybody tells you that. I mean, we saw her, everybody just admired her at her sister's funeral. Now you tell us how you gave birth to a baby without medi medicines. How good is that for your baby? Maybe you can inspire many. I told the story of my daughter to you, how she gave birth with mantras, and you got that story. Now you are doing it, and now you can pass it on to a hundred other women who don't believe. Do you see how it works? And then we can change all this. Because childbirth is meant to be beautiful, not this, this thing that people have put on it. I mean, women have been having children for how many countless of millions of years? And now, all the women, I'm so frightened. The poor baby is getting those awful vibrations of fear. The baby doesn't deserve fear. The baby deserves love and kindness. And I'm so excited to have you. I'm really excited to have you, but I think I'm going to have that. Do remember that this? Oh, and which day? And which time? What a lot of stress and tension in childbirth today. Hmm? And the poor baby is full of that energy. For what? We all know, scientifically proven already, that whatever the mother thinks will go to the child, whatever is around the child, go to the child. That's why we're so happy you're pregnant here with us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm child is getting all that knowledge. Mm -hmm. So, that is five for seven. I didn't want to finish earlier this evening. Okay, yeah, so that we can sing some Christmas carols, yes, mm -hmm. and share some. Uh, yeah. Question. Uh, sure. What, what does it mean to initiate? We're talking about initiation. Oh, initiation. Okay, good question. Anybody else not know initiation? No, I don't know. Okay, great. Now, uh, I just mentioned that Master Shivananda was the master of my master. Initiation is a mantra that is passed on from guru to disciple over the generations. And um, what happens is when a person really, really, really starts to feel, I need a mantra, I need a mantra, then the disciple will give the mantra to the student. So initiation is giving like the seed, like I call it, the telephone line to the big guys up there. Hmm? It's a telephone line. How I got my mantra was very, very unusual. It's not usual. Most people have a ceremony, etc., etc. Now I do that too. Um, but every ceremony I do is different thanks to my master because he told me to do it my way. Hmm? But um, how I got my mantra was when I started this path, um, I got like six months into meditation, six months into forgiving people, you know, that was my meditation. First thing, learn to forgive. That was the first thing I started. And have no anger in your heart. So, about after six months later, I had this feeling, I really want a mantra. I really want a mantra. I don't know why I want a mantra, but I want a mantra. It came from within. Okay, one night, I'm dreaming, and... Um, I get up, it's about 10 to 7 in the morning, and I tell my husband, darling, I had such a beautiful dream. I dreamt that I wanted a mantra, and I told my guru, Gurudev, I want a mantra. 
And he said, okay, Nani, here's your mantra. I'm talking to him. The phone rings. I pick up the phone. My husband is my witness. Nani, are you ready for your mantra? Mm -hmm. 10 to 7 in the morning is like 1 a.m. in the States, because he was in the States. Are you ready for your mantra? Do you have a pen and paper? Yes. Write it down. Okay. Said it two times to me. Goodbye, Nani, I'm sleeping now. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how I got mine. For most people, you get it when you really feel it in your heart. You know, I, I, you just, it's a feeling you get. It's a natural feeling. And, uh, and then you ask for initiation. So that's what my master told me I could do. And that's what I do. When people ask and they really want it, it's their connection. I'm just the instrument to pass on to connect with the highest one. It's your direct connection with the highest one. But a mantra, initiation, is as, as good as you use it. You know, you can plant a seed. If you don't water it and if you don't look after it, what will happen? It'll die. So when you're given a mantra, it is really important to practice yama niyama, which is, you know, all the yamas and the yamas, and then you water it, and then the mantra will grow in you until you feel that total communication with the divine all the time. All the time. It worked for me. I constantly use the mantra. I wake up in the middle of the night, I hear it. I'm in trouble, I hear it. Because I've repeated it so much over the years, non-stop, that it works by itself inside. You know sometimes when you're thinking, you can think like from here and from here. Do you know what I mean? Have you had that feeling? Like you've got a thought here, but there's another thought coming from here. Have you had that watching that thought, right? That's the self, watching the thought. Well, the mantra comes from a very deep place. You're thinking, and there's another thought that overrides it. So it's very easy to cut the negative with a mantra. Because why? A mantra is neutral. It just has energy from the master. It's neutral. It doesn't say good. It doesn't say bad. Right? It's just neutral. And when you're disturbed, what do you need to be? Neutral. neutral. So you can understand what's going on here. Okay? So, good question. Melanie, can I ask you one? I can give you notes on mantra initiation if you'd like. Yes. Just my memory is so bad. I forgot one thing. Why we are, aren't allowed it to tell other people what is our mantra when we are initiated? I just forgot. Why I don't okay. allowed? What? Because, you know, when you tell... One, it has a power and energy of its own. Mm -hmm. Right? And it's like I said, a phone line. You don't want interference in your phone line. Uh, sometimes when you tell people your mantra, they might use it against you because words have a lot of power, energy. You know, you 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 know, I really don't like to talk about these things, but they do exist in this world. Very private. It's very private, and you should treasure it. Mm -hmm. It should be yours. It is. It, it's it's private. It's it's so special. It's a diamond. And sometimes when you tell, it's like gossip. If you tell people, people make fun of it. And they take it in vain, or they joke about it. You know, ah, mantra. And, and it should not, it should be really well respected. It's your prime, it's your communication with the divine. Keep it like a treasure. It's yours, it's your talking to God on his line. Why would you want to tell anybody? You know, when they're angry with you, they may use it against you sometimes, because it has a force. Sometimes when students are asking, oh, what is your mantra? And, yeah. You, yeah, you see, my own initiated mantra is personal. But yeah. if you want to use any normal mantra, you can use Hari Om, Om Namah Shivaya. You tell them that Om Shanti, whatever you feel comfortable with, it, with until they're ready for their own personal mantra. Mm -hmm. And it should always come from a lineage. All right? Mm -hmm. It should come from a good line. Because now you get many new gurus who say they're gurus and it should come from a line that's, you know, guru, disciple, guru, disciple, guru, disciple. Always follow the lineage and that's when you know you're quite safe. Because it's over a long time, over many, many centuries. And so of course the word 
has power. Anything you use for a long time has power. You build up the power. You build up the energy. You build up the talent for it. I always say, like, um, when you play the piano, in the beginning, you have no power. You don't even know how to play it well. But then when you learn to play it with all your heart and all your soul, you just play it so beautifully. That music has so much power. It has so much energy. That makes everybody, all the audience, stand up and, yeah, more. Look at the power of a beautiful voice on earth. So you think what power a mantra has when you respect it and you love it and you treasure it. What power will it have in you? And that's how I feel it. And nobody should make fun of my God. And the choice uh, for everyone is different. You have the choice of mantra for... Depending on the school. On the school. Depending on the school. Depending on the school of thought from that master. Every master has their own school of thought. So I'd like to finish off with this one, so I don't keep you too late with it. Because this is the next sutra. Egoism is the identification, as it were, of the power of the seer, Purusha, another word for your spirit or soul is Purusha, with that of the instrument of seeing, body, mind. So the body, mind is your instrument. And when you identify with your body and mind, that is egoism. Okay? That's simply saying that. But really, you are soul, is the soul identifies with the body and the mind, and then you develop egoism. And I'd like to read something from the Upanishads for you, which explains this so beautifully. And if you don't understand anything, stop me, because it's really important that you understand it. Okay? Stop me and I'll explain it. Is that okay? I love this, because this really explains the ego and the self that lives in you. Like two golden birds perched on the self-same tree. Now, I want you to imagine this tree and two golden birds. Can you imagine it? Because if you can see it, you can understand it. Intimate friends. The ego and the self. Intimate friends. Dwell in the same body. The ego and the self. Dwell in the same body. They're golden, They're golden birds, born to fly. <clears throat> the former, which means the ego, eats the sweet and sour fruits of the tree of life, while the latter, which is the self, looks on in detachment. Understood that? As long as we think we are the ego, we feel attached and fall into sorrow. But realize that you are the self, the Lord of life, and you will be freed from sorrow. When you realize that you are the self, supreme source of light, supreme source of love, you transcend the duality of life and enter into a unitive state. The Lord of love, shines in the hearts of all. Again, we hear it. The Lord of love shines in the heart of all. Seeing him in all creatures, the wise forget themselves in the service of all. The Lord is their joy. The Lord is their rest. Such are they, are the lovers of the Lord. By truth, meditation, self-control, one can enter into the state of joy and see the self shining in a pure heart. Truth is victorious, never untruth. Truth is the way. Truth is the goal of life, reached by sages who are free from self-will. The effulgent self 
who is beyond thought, shines in the greatest, shines in the smallest, shines in the furthest, shines in the nearest, shines in the secret chamber of your very own heart. Beyond the reach of senses is he, but not beyond the reach of a mind stilled through the, the practice of deep meditation. Beyond the reach of words and works is he, but not beyond the reach of a pure heart freed from the sway of the senses. Sages are granted all the help they need in everything they do to serve this Lord. Let all those who seek their own fulfillment love and honor the illumined sage. And I could go on for ages because I just love this. is so beautiful. The Upanishads is so beautiful. So that's who we are. The self and the ego that communicates with the world. The ego is given to us. So we can enjoy both the sweet and sour fruits of the earth. We soon learn while we're enjoying the sweet and sour both that, you know, we don't like the sour so much and we like the sweet more. But you enjoy both while you realize that the real you is just watching it. I know that we are all born from this energy called love. And we've gone so far away from it. And that's why we're all yearning for it to come back. But it's already in us. It's all in us. It's that for generations we've lived in such darkness. And every generation through generation, we've been sent such beautiful lights to show us the way. But what we've done is like what my master said, you put the garland on me, but you don't practice the teaching. What's the point? Better you practice the teaching in yourself. Bring out the light in yourself. Shine of yourself. Grow in your light. Be your light. The only way you can be your light is to remove the darkness. That's the only way you can be in the light. Light a match. The light will come. So, understand this, this glacier well, ignorance, egoism, and keep, you know, the world, as soon as you walk out the door, the world will tell you otherwise. No, I'm, Lord of love loves me, wants me to be happy, because I can experience God only for me. That's why we are all made so differently. If the Lord of love did not exist in all of us, we would all be clones, one big clone. Why create so many different individuals? Because that God is so great, so huge, it wanted each one of us to find it in our own way. You know, I mean, Steve, you can only enjoy Steve when Steve is joyful and at peace. And only you can know God in Steve's body. And Karen, you can only know Karen in God when you have this light of God in you and offer it back to God. And this is why it says in the Bhagavad Gita chapter 12, those devotees who are without fear, guilt, or worry, those things stop you. Who are full of anger cannot find me. But those who are free from those things, who love me and see everybody in me, and see me in, and thank you for correcting me, see me in everybody, see me in everybody, even though they don't see it. They may not see it. And this is wisdom. They don't see it, let it go, but you see it in them. And know that. And how I learned to live with this is to know that. Okay, everybody is wonderful and everybody is a lot of love, but not everybody has a clean mind. Some minds are sick and some minds don't want help. Stay away. And some minds are sick but need help. Go cure them. They want help, but they don't know how to find it. Cure their minds. 
but tell, cure their minds by telling them how beautiful they are inside. It just got the mind got sick. Why did it get sick? Because it regarded the impermanent as permanent, the painful as pleasurable, the pure, the impure as pure, and the non-self as the self. And this is heavy duty for people to understand, so you just put it in nice, simple words for them. And I tell them, why do you think you're miserable? There's so much anger in front of, inside of you. Yes, but this person did this to me, did, but did that to me. Yes, they did it to you, they hurt you, but you're the one that's keeping the anger. So it's not their fault. You don't keep your anger. How do I get rid of it? Forgiving the other person because you want to be free. Be selfish. <laughs> be selfish. You want to be free. So you tell them in their own language, they can understand that. Be selfish. So the only way you can be free is forgiving the other person. No other way. If you're angry at the other person, you cannot be free, can you? You'll never be free. So teach people the language they understand. And that is knowledge. Don't give them a lot of fancy words where they can't understand. They think, you're, oh, you're so smart, but it does them no good. What's the point? It's like this Buddhist monk says, simply just be good, do good, live a good life as much as you can, wherever you can. Be kind. When you end your life, your mind will be kind. That's where you will go to a kind place. Doesn't matter if you reach enlightenment or not. All this talk about enlightenment. I am enlightened. You know, my poor niece went to a discotheque in, in Hong Kong and somebody went and told her, Oh, you know, I'm enlightened, so why don't you come home with me? Because <laughs> <laughs> you have a yoga following of a thousand people or two thousand people. Doesn't, you know, come on. She, she's smart, thank God. You know what she said? <gasps> And you know, gave me the creeps. He was trying to hypnotize me with his power. <laughs> and I said, what did you do? So I walked away. Yes. <laughs> so many people don't walk away. So many people don't walk away. You have to use your common sense. Common sense. Just see what makes you feel good at the end of the day. Let it be truthful. Let it be simple. Let it be nice. Live in that state of peace. And when there's so many thoughts and so many debates, ask yourself, what for? What will it, you know, after you found out what problems disturb you as a child, I mean, how many times can you see a psychologist with the same problem? Again, and again, and again. Every time you talk about that problem, it grows. Did you know that? But the less you talk about it, you forget about it. See? Don't talk about initiation, but no, I forgot, right? Isn't it true? When you don't talk about something, you forget about it. But when you talk about it, you remember it. So talk about goodness, kindness, and then you remember it, you know? I'm not this body, I'm not this mind. You can't talk to the world like that, they'll think you're crazy, but you can talk to yourself like that. And if somebody insults you, you can smile. Their problem, not mine. I don't need to take that insult. I don't need to take it. Because I'm not silly and I'm not stupid and I know who I am. So they call me a vegetable or, you know, you, you're a rabbit because you eat vegetarian. You go, yes, I am. I'm really happy about it too. So don't want to insult me anymore because it's, I'm not offended. I'm not offended. I'm very happy to be like a rabbit. No problem. No problem. Isn't it true? We give people power when we allow them to overcome us. Never give your power away.